Okay, so 602, um, let me introduce the, the overall program very briefly. This is uh, Santa Clara Valley's uh, corporate liaison program, Industry Spotlight. This is 18th uh, instance of this, and we are extremely honored and pleasured uh, to host Michael Schwinn, who graciously agreed to talk uh, about sustainable AI at scale. Uh, but I will let Paolo Faraboski, who is on the program committee, of, of CLP, as well as Shmuel Shatter, who also attend, attends, introduce Michael. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Schwind. Um, he currently leads the accelerator enablement at Meta AI, former Facebook, where he is responsible for the software development for accelerators and the deployment of AI at scale. Uh, I've known Mike for uh, probably, I guess, what, 20 years or something like this. And he has previously held very important positions. Um, um, the last one before uh, Meta was as a AI chief architect at Huawei. And most of his career he spent at IBM leading both hardware and software work in AI and general purpose system. He was one of the key architects of three supercomputers um, that at the time were among the, the fast systems and three game console chips, um, you know, PlayStation, Xbox, and Wii. He also invented Cell, one of the first programmable accelerators and uh, led development of various pieces of accelerator hardware and software. He's an IEEE fellow, uh, author of over hundred papers and one very prolific inventor in, um, um, in the Inventors Hall of Fame with uh, over 800 patents. Actually, if you go to Wikipedia and look up, you know, most prolific inventors, Mike is there. So uh, with that introduction, I am going to pass the token to Mike and he's going to talk about sustainable AI at scale. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Dan. I'm excited to be here today. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I want, I'm excited to talk about sustainability and AI by uh, delivering sustainable AI at scale and how we accelerate AI models for billions of users uh, with uh, efficient uh, systems. So to practice AI at the scale that Meta and other large um, hyperscalers uh, find today, uh, we need to scale to a complete model portfolio uh, where AI models perform trillions of inference operations every day uh, for billions of people that uh, use our technologies. Um, so we need to scale to a billion plus users and run optimally at uh, Meta's scale and for everyone. And finally, we need to scale to a range of deployments regardless of what device, operating system, or even the quality of internet connection that uh, users may have. Facebook AI uh, operates for a billion strong community. Um, it all starts out with the content that uh, our users create. Uh, and uh, that content is uh, analyzed by AI to accomplish uh, different tasks. On the one hand, to do content recommendation, to recommend uh, posts of your friends, news items, uh, other um, information that uh, you as a user would be likely interested to see, to do translation, to build global communities that uh, transcend language barriers, and finally, for content understanding, to aid in content review, to identify harmful or illegal content and remove that uh, from the community. Uh, and so uh, today our models are built with PyTorch, the industry's leading shared and open AI framework uh, that uh, we develop here at Meta. It's an open source framework uh, that provides, uh, it's, a, it's the state-of-the-art AI framework for the global AI community for both researchers uh, in academia and industrial research labs, as well as uh, for uh, developers and practitioners uh, building uh, models for uh, deployment. Uh, it offers best of breed extensibility and uh, libraries that enable reuse and uh, enable uh, developers to focus on 
the innovation in their model and uh, take the chore of uh, repeat uh, functionality off their shoulders by providing strong libraries. And uh, finally, it's optimized for impact um, to share our results in a common environment that uh, maximizes research impact that allows others to reuse models and fosters reproducibility and speed up, uh, speeds up adoption. Um, if we look at uh, how we use PyTorch uh, today at Meta, uh, we run over 4,000 models uh, on PyTorch every day. Um, there, there are uh, 1,700 infer over seven, 1,700 inference models uh, today in full production running PyTorch and uh, 90, over 93% of uh, training of models happens on that PyTorch platform. Um, PyTorch is also uh, very widely used uh, by our partners in the ecosystem. Um, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, Google Cloud, all uh, use uh, PyTorch to uh, power important parts of uh, their applications and their users' applications. PyTorch is a environment that uh, spans uh, the entire range from research to production. And that is uh, an important attribute to, uh, to enable early experimentation uh, where developers can execute with uh, familiar EGA mode, uh, Python style uh, semantics uh, where uh, during development, PyTorch uh, model developers are productive with the efficient training stacks and domain libraries that PyTorch has. And it goes all the way to deployment where PyTorch supports efficient model deployments with uh, Torch script, computation graphs, chip compilation, and efficient uh, accelerator uh, backends. If uh, we look at the importance of AI, uh, in terms of server growth, you can see that over the last several years, the growth has been significant, uh, both in terms of uh, recommendation models and even more so for other ML models that are focused on content understanding. And um, that uh, drives uh, server capacity growth uh, that um, year over year uh, is uh, very significant. Um, so what's uh, driving uh, the deep learning era? It's really a virtuous cycle of uh, better algorithms leading to better systems uh, that allow us to collect bigger and better data that in turn inspire creation of even better algorithms. AI is one of the fastest growing domains in the past decade spanning research, product development and application use cases. And uh, just for, let, let's have a look how we got there. Over the past 20 years, we've seen a very significant investment in deep learning. And uh, a lot of that has come from uh, significant algorithmic advances that have driven new use cases. And a lot of these algorithmic advances have been powered by fundamental uh, advances in the hardware and software systems, um, such as um, the PyTorch open source framework and uh, also accelerators. And uh, on top of that, uh, we've had access to a significant amount and grown amount of data of better quality and with more tools to aggregate and process them. So. Uh, we really are seeing a virtuous cycle here that uh, has led uh, to AI being able to deliver um, ever better results. Um, but that has come uh, at a price. The exponential growth that AI has seen comes with significant overhead. And despite the positive social benefits uh, that uh, we can see uh, a broader range of AI applications. The scaling trend of AI can incur a 
large energy and environmental footprint. Um, in that sense, the AI industry is often compared to the oil industry. Once mined and refined, uh, data like oil uh, is a highly lucrative uh, commodity. And uh, so uh, if we look at uh, the cost of uh, models, of training state-of-the-art models in 2019, um, that uh, was equivalent to the lifetime of uh, three cars, including the manufacturing. But um, it gets even worse if you're looking at uh, you're looking at even greater resources uh, to transfer existing models or develop new models to do architect neural architecture search and uh, experimentation. Uh, we can see uh, significant uh, CO2 uh, equivalent emissions. Um, so um, these, these results here come from, from a paper that's been published uh, showing the um, consumption of uh, energy and the associated uh, car carbon dioxide emissions uh, for a CPU for running a model for one day, for training a model for one day with CPU and GPU. Of course, uh, GPU is much more efficient. So at the end of the day, uh, you will um, run that training for a shorter period. Nevertheless, um, carbon emissions for training recent models keep growing uh, with the complexity of the model. And uh, I'll point out that uh, the scale of uh, the chart at the bottom is logarithmic. So uh, that just gives you a sense of how um, massive that uh, uh, carbon footprint uh, is uh, but associated with training AI models. Uh, a analysis from uh, OpenAI showed that since 2012, the amount of compute uh, used in the largest AI training runs has in been increasing exponentially, but uh, um, a 3.4, 3.5 months doubling time. Um, and uh, the computing power that uh, that is needed to drive that training has, of course, uh, increased proportionally with that. Um, so if you look at that, that is no longer um, that uh, massively exceeds the rate of uh, the hardware efficiency improvements that uh, we can get out of scaling, out of multi-cores, and even out of accelerators. So uh, the uh, net challenge here is that we need to build ever larger systems to both uh, train these models and then to operate these models on behalf of the users. Um, so um, stepping back, why, do, why does uh, sustainable AI matter in this context? AI capacity uh, affects uh, both what we can do and it, in, and it affects our environment. So on the one hand, uh, we cannot uh, sustain uh, the exponential capacity growth from a technical perspective. There is um, the, we just cannot uh, build systems that are large enough that will uh, follow uh, that trajectory that uh, we have seen for the very largest AI models. And uh, secondly, uh, that capacity growth is not sustainable environmentally. So uh, it's been our focus to drive efficiency for AI uh, through a variety of means, uh, through higher quality uh, of models, uh, through more efficient hardware, um, and uh, many other measures that together feed into our sustainability strategy at Meta, uh, or that is part of our sustainability strategy at Meta uh, to be net uh, carbon free uh, in our operations. So um, that 
steps. Seems like uh, that should not be a hard problem on the surface of it. If you think of uh, everybody will sort of see the benefits of why this is positive, why this is desi something desirable. But so where is uh, the hardness of this problem? Well, uh, it starts with some flawed assumptions. Uh, first off, that people actually care about efficiency and uh, that also that all demand is a legitimate demand. There's, while hardware is a part of the solution, um, the belief that hardware efficiency alone can solve this problem is misguided. And uh, finally, uh, the belief that uh, any one player in our industry, uh, whether that's Meta or, or another company, uh, can solve this alone as misguided. Let me just uh, touch on some of the reasons why that's the case. So first off, um, as engineers, we believe that, we might believe that uh, everybody cares about efficiency, uh, but the reality is that uh, different people care about different things. Uh, people often care most uh, about what they're incentivized to care about. So if you look, for example, at AI papers, um, most conferences target accuracy uh, rather than efficiency. Uh, and uh, so here is a survey of uh, papers uh, submitted to some of the major conferences in our field. And you can see that uh, in terms of number of papers, uh, the uh, emphasis um, of papers is typically improving accuracy um, and uh, to a much smaller extent, uh, if at all, to op optimize uh, efficiency. There were no papers in, at ACL 2018 targeting efficiency alone. Um, at just two papers, between two and four papers for CDPR and new reps. Um, so, um, that, that drives behaviors, that uh, drives innovation towards the metrics that are incentivized. And um, even if we see uh, marginal gains, the chart on the right-hand side here uh, plots the top accuracy for ImageNet models um, as a function of the number of parameters and color-coded uh, the year in which uh, a particular model was developed. As you can see over time, the accuracy goes up uh, across uh, the entire spectrum of uh, model complexity. Um, at the same time, we find that larger and larger models by orders of magnitude, larger models are being developed that offer um, only a very marginal uh, improvement. So um, that directly reflects uh, the incentive structure of, um, of uh, these communities uh, that draw uh, you know, the focus of innovation into uh, accuracy uh, at uh, the det detriment of efficiency and uh, balancing different uh, goals. Um, another uh, another flawed assumption is that uh, ML accelerators alone will save the day. Um, so um, if you look at uh, efficiency gains that the AI community has obtained for, uh, for example, for computer vision is uh, plotted here. Uh, since 2012, uh, there's been a 44 uh, X improvement in efficiency in networks compared to a just 11x uh, improvement uh, of hardware um, based on Moore's law. So um, the net takeaway is that algorithmic improvements uh, can affect outcomes and um, efficiency much more than hardware alone can do. Of course, the two are multiplicative, so uh, there is a there is uh, the, uh, this is call, uh, calling for a multifaceted end-to-end uh, um, -end approach uh, at 
to achieving uh, efficiency uh, for, for models. There's also Chivon's paradox that says that uh, the more efficient you make hardware, um, you will still see the rate of consumption increase because people find more uses for that hardware uh, when that hardware can unlock new capabilities, new possibilities. So um, in, in some sense, hardware efficiency is uh, tempting to build uh, larger uh, models. Uh, so uh, we need a parallel effort uh, driving efficiency. Um, finally, um, there's a flawed uh, assumption that uh, any uh, one um, player in this ecosystem can solve this problem alone. Uh, one of uh, my, uh, my Udit Gupta uh, published uh, a paper on uh, the environmental footprint of computing. And we can find that uh, uh, a significant amount of emissions is uh, inherited from the supply chain. So even if uh, a company optimizes their own operations to be uh, net carbon zero, uh, zero uh, by acquiring computer systems, uh, for example, they inherit, uh, in that sense, the um, CO2 emissions uh, that um, the supply chain expanded in, in building and delivering those systems. So uh, if we want to focus on sustainability from end to end, uh, we need that accountability throughout the community and into the supply chain to ensure that uh, the um, environmental uh, sustainability is, is considered uh, end to end. Uh, in terms of our own um, sustainability uh, journey, uh, it's been Facebook's um, and now Meta's uh, goal uh, to achieve uh, net uh, carbon zero operation. Uh, we achieved that for operations, uh, and now we're working on uh, removing uh, or mitigating the um, emissions uh, associated with uh, other aspects of the operation, such as supply chain and uh, uh, obtaining uh, zero em emissions, uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, for example. So what is sustainable AI then? It's AI systems that can yield novel results and advance the business value while considering the computational cost and encourage the reduction in, in resources spent. And um, in that uh, context, uh, what we want to imagine is a future for AI uh, where all systems are built with a efficiency as a metric alongside accuracy and uh, where we measure not just uh, where we also measure cost efficiency and CO2 emissions and where uh, we have tooling and information uh, to compare and reference uh, the impact of uh, different model choices, leaderboards, model cards, and uh, to drive uh, more efficient architectures that can be trained with less data. Um, at some level, that becomes a community flywheel when uh, we can uh, change the metrics that uh, the community uh, optimizes for. And uh, so uh, as part of this effort uh, of, for AI sustainability, we're working with the community uh, with uh, players like uh, Papers with Toad, MLPerf, uh, and uh, uh, GitHub and Archive to figure out how we can um, associate and track metrics uh, for models with common tooling as, for example, as available um, uh, as we're starting to uh, release with uh, PyTorch, looking to release with PyTorch. Um, so let me look at some uh, optimization opportunities. 
challenges and the next steps that we see. So on the one hand, uh, there is a focus on uh, data utilization efficiency. Uh, data scaling is the, is the de facto approach today to increase model quality, where the primary factor for accuracy improvements is given by the size and the quality of the training data um, more than algorithmic optimization. So uh, we find that uh, with intelligent data sampling, we can be much more efficient. Um, and uh, also that not all data is created equal. Uh, data collected um, loses its value, its predictive value uh, gradually over time. So uh, that, uh, for example, for recommendation systems, uh, there is no point uh, or a little point in training uh, with uh, older data. And um, so uh, we can uh, be more efficient in, in the training process. Also, um, uh, we think that uh, more focus uh, can be put on resource efficient modeling techniques uh, with resource efficient models and resource aware neural architecture search and uh, by employing uh, more and more sophisticated uh, quantization, pruning, and distillation. Um, for example, neural architecture search is a technique that automates the design space exploration for neural networks. And uh, despite its capability to discover higher, higher performing networks, uh, NAS itself is an um, extremely inten resource intensive process because of uh, the many models that uh, are, are explored and uh, that increases the environmental footprint. As we make NAS more efficient, that will directly translate into uh, a carbon footprint reduction. Uh, and uh, ultimately, it might also lead to uh, faster turnaround in identifying new and more efficient models um, by reducing runtime and uh, achieving overall end to end uh, higher uh, result quality at lower cost. Similarly, quantization is a key opportunity to reduce the number of bits per rate per computation and uh, the, uh, the associated power dissipation. Um, similarly, knowledge distillation is a process to transfer the knowledge learned by a very complex neural network to a much a, a teacher model, uh, to a much simpler student model to increase the accuracy of that uh, student network without uh, the associated complexity. All right. Okay. Finally, turning to systems and infrastructure, um, there are several architectural opportunities. On the one hand, we can disaggregate machine learning pipeline stages. Uh, to drive uh, efficiency and uh, we uh, allowing uh, us to scale accelerate training accelerators network and storage IO bandwidth uh, independently, making the whole system more efficiency uh, efficient. Also um, a AI accelerators can be a key driver for efficiency um, to, uh, especially been combined uh, with uh, accelerator virtualization of multi-tenancy support where uh, we, can, we as the community can make uh, better, more efficient use of accelerators by sharing uh, the uh, accelerator hardware uh, that is typically associated with uh, rather high um, uh, power uh, dissipation. And uh, finally, um, designing our AI systems, at, including at the data center level, with uh, environmental sustainability in mind.
Um, that being said, much more uh, remains to be done. And uh, both in terms of uh, M uh, machine learning model exploration, uh, such as early stopping uh, to avoid uh, the diminishing uh, returns of uh, the final tail end in the training process, checkpointing to reduce uh, the uh, need to start restart training from uh, the beginning when uh, configurations change or uh, when a model training run uh, needs to be interrupted and restarted, and uh, efficient uh, hyperparameter optimization to get uh, more efficient uh, operation from models. Also, uh, developing easy to adopt telemetry for assessing AI's environmental footprint will allow us to drive uh, optimizations more quickly and also the availability of uniform metrics. Finally, uh, we believe that carbon impact statements and model cards for models will be a uh, another driver that can uh, put the focus on uh, delivering more efficient, higher quality models. Um, so uh, I've talked a lot about training. Uh, I want to, so if we look at the flow of uh, models uh, in uh, a typical deployment envi environment, we start out the data that goes uh, through the feature uh, engineering uh, and training. And uh, then uh, we get the model that is used for inference. In fact, that is where most models spend uh, the bulk of their lifetime and uh, potentially uh, be um, a, a, most of, of the power dissipated uh, by a model. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, inference and uh, how uh, we can optimize uh, for more efficient inference with accelerators. Um, the reason why we focus on accelerators is that over time, the model complexity has uh, grown exponentially, but uh, the gain through Moore's law in terms of uh, processor efficiency has uh, it flattened. So uh, we're turning to accelerators has been uh, one solution to um, drive efficiency, to drive uh, performance for uh, model inference. Uh, as I mentioned, it can't be the only solution, but it is a part of uh, the end-to-end -end solution that we use. Um, at Meta, we have uh, both uh, GPUs and uh, a uh, ASIC uh, accelerator strategy in terms of GPUs. Uh, GPUs today are supported organically and integrated in PyTorch with Giga mode execution, with Torch script chip execution, and with CUDA graph based execution. It's widely used for training and uh, we share enablement uh, between training and inference. Uh, so it, it offers a efficient inference solution for many, many models as well. In parallel, um, there is a custom inference acceleration effort uh, built in ASICs that uses graph-based execution and uh, where we're focused on building a multi-vendor shared ecosystem for acceleration that uh, benefits all players uh, in the industry. Um, let me turn to a use case where we use that today uh, to we, uh, use uh, NLP models, content understanding models today to fight hate speech, misinformation, and uh, identify other undesirable uh, content. And we, for that, we use high quality multilingual models that uh, bring years of research in multilingual uh, content understanding uh, into production to desire 
uh, to detect undesirable content, hate speech, bullying, misinformation, and uh, other uh, inappropriate uh, or illegal content. Uh, we accomplished that with fast model execution by using accelerators to meet uh, the response time SLAs, even for complex compute intensive large scale, mo large -scale models uh, that can have over 3 billion parameters. And uh, accelerators are a part of uh, the sustainability uh, solution uh, together with uh, ongoing architecture optimization um, that allow us to deploy large scale models uh, such as uh, the XLMR models that uh, Meta has published um, and uh, that uh, deliver um, high quality, but uh, a environmental goal of sustainability. So um, to summarize, uh, AI sustainability is a critical driver to keep AI growing. Uh, and uh, we can achieve that by joint focus on both model efficiency and model accuracy. Um, that way we can achieve sustainable growth uh, by driving, by uh, encouraging uh, innovation around more efficient network architectures, uh, by optimizing workflows uh, for training, but early stopping, checkpointing, um, hyperparameter optimization, and finally, uh, by uh, using acceleration to uh, deliver a more efficient hardware uh, platform. Uh, we use PyTorch as the ecosystem for collaboration on AI workload systems and sustainability. And uh, we have uh, projects underway to build more tools to understand model efficiency and the sustainability impact uh, because we believe that green AI enables AI to grant, uh, grow sustainably and uh, responsibly and deliver uh, even better high quality results in the future. So at this point, um, I'll conclude my presentation and I'll be happy to uh, take some questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Great presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we have uh, one question already. Um, everybody else, please type in your questions, or you can also speak it up if you do it in an orderly manner. Uh, the first question has been partially uh, already answered, but we, uh, the, the Peter McKinnon, uh, wanted to ask you is, can you address whether Meta uses AI in any way to manage its carbon footprint across its operations and supply chains? If so, how? And if not, is it in the plans? I don't think I'm authorized to uh, talk to uh, specific okay. uses of uh, AI. Okay. Like no problem. Paolo, why don't you ask in person? You typed in the question. Yeah, happy to. I mean, uh, my question is, uh, you know, uh, you, we're looking at AI, but uh, as a workload, but really we should probably look at um, what AI is, is used for. So what I'm trying to understand is I, I realize that in many cases, I think a lot of people use AI or specifically deep learning just because they can, right? I mean, uh, you don't charge your developers for AI uh, and and neither does do some of the large hyperscalers. But, you know, it turns out that uh, in many cases, not all, but you know, maybe simpler heuristics or you know traditional ML techniques, which are far less computational intensive, could get very similar accuracy, right? So, uh, is there a way to kind of create some incentives so that we we don't waste <laughs> resources to to run deep learning when it's really not needed? Or, um, I think first off, if we incentivize the and reward efficiency. People will, uh, developers will automatically uh, turn to more uh, efficient methods. So uh, I think that, that you're breaking up a bit, Mike. I don't know if it's just me, but I can't hear you very well. I think if we incentivize efficiency, developers will turn even more to that, those methods uh, in. Uh, meta today, we have, we do have a, a range of models. Not every model is a deep learning model. Not 
every application um, needs learning. There are uh, applications that um, all the analytical models. Um, and uh, I think there's uh, just a, a broad range of uh, possible solutions and, uh, upon us to um, incentivize, to encourage uh, the, the most appropriate uh, solution that uh, maximizes both um, accuracy, uh, quality of results. Uh, there's also an economic very costly to build data centers here in the top. So, um, uh, so it also involves rather playing in the wall. So, we can build models today uh, that uh, can run the smaller uh, data center uh, capacity here. Let's go. Uh, opportunity for faster. So, Michael, Paolo is right. You are breaking. I'm not sure if you could possibly get closer to the mic as you answer the questions. Yeah, it worked fine during the presentation. You seem to have either moved the mic or, you know, yeah. talking to another device. Uh, somehow we couldn't really hear your answer. But Okay, anyways, we have another question from Tom Coughlin. Um, I have heard of some approaches for faster learning using SNNs, e.g. brain chip, applied for edge applications. Would these approaches also be useful for data centers? Um, I'm not familiar uh, with uh, the specific publication, um, so I can't comment on that. Okay, no problem. So the next question by Man Chung. Thank you for inspiring talk. Today, many AI systems focus on specific tasks, and we need to train another model for slightly different task. How do you think general AI as a direction for sustainable AI? Um, so... Today we're we're still pushing for uh, the boundaries on domain specific AI. So I don't. I think uh, also I'm not an AI researcher. I'm a AI systems uh, person. So um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to speculate. Okay. Then. Uh, the next question from Colin Bash. How did Facebook achieve carbon negative? Was this primarily through use of renewable energy? Um, we have a big focus on acquiring um, renewable energy. Um, we have, uh, I think, uh, used carbon offset, uh, offsets uh, in, in small amounts. And I think generally, um, there's been a uh, great focus on the efficiency uh, in all aspects of uh, Facebook's operation, starting with uh, building uh, energy efficient buildings, et cetera. So uh, there is a end-to-end a, 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 a focus, not just on efficient AI, but uh, on uh, sustainability uh, around the company um, from uh, Firing power uh, to operation. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Ramon de la Cruz. Does meta AI system optimization also include reviewing, revising, and then updating the correctness, applicability uh, of the vast amount of raw data being used to reach valid solutions with the current AI algorithms? Hi. And comment on that. Um, that is not uh, my uh, area of subject matter expert. Okay. Uh, now another lengthy question, and you may open up chat as well. I'll I'll keep on reading, but 
This one is really lengthy. You may forget by the time I get there. Number of models deployed in production. It's 1,700 to 4,000. I think these are neural network-based models. Does not look like a very big number to me for a company like Meta. And I'm sure a lot of researchers have been working on these models and continue to do so. So do you think there's still space for improving ML metrics like accuracy that will result in better business metrics like increased revenue? Or is it more about inventing better neural network architectures to improve hardware utilization, reduce time to desire accuracy, etc.? This is question by Sergey Serbiakov. Um, I think the I think there is more room to deliver better business metrics and optimize uh, the models um, for better efficiency uh, as well. So um, I think, in fact, um, to keep driving up uh, accuracy and, and business metrics, we need to build uh, more energy efficient systems to develop more energy algorithm works um, because uh, otherwise they'll be not an affordable they'll be, uh, just uh, impossible to build data centers to house uh, algorithms that are, are not the necessary and just use like uh, brute force approaches by spending more energy not in the parts in terms of Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, next question is coming from me. Uh, do you foresee any technology that can dramatically improve sustainability? So, for example, uh, there's a belief that most cost in computer systems nowadays is in moving data. So, if we do increase the adoption of silicon photonics, it's just one example. I'm not saying this is the solution. But do you foresee on the horizon any techniques like, for example, silicon photonics that can dramatically and transparently improve sustainability? Um, I think there's there's a broad range of uh, technologies that are possible uh, and deliver uh, higher efficiency. Um, yeah. Uh, and Many of those were adopted them will become available. There is, there remains, and will always be room for more innovation. Okay, and I have the next question. I'm just curious. I mean, I thought I had many patents, but and I heard that you had over 800. You know, I was so pleasantly shocked. Can you tell us how do you patent? What's your approach to uh, patenting? Do you have a strategy? Do you uh, look at portfolios? Can you advise, especially the young, ignore me, I don't matter, you know, but the younger colleagues who are on this call, do you have any advice for them? I think uh, the challenge is to find interesting problems uh, that need to be solved. And if you have that, I think, uh, you know, uh, that will drive uh, identifying uh, opportunities for innovation. Um, I think it's also with finding the right problems to solve. Okay, uh, we got a couple of more questions. Uh, the next one is from Neil Nilash Negi. Do you think these techniques for efficiency-oriented optimization? change, refine as you approach very large scale systems like RSC. Can you please share some examples how Meta is achieving this with RSC? Um, I don't think I'm able to talk about RSC at this point beyond uh, what you've already heard. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Men Chong again. How is the progress in building tools to measure model efficiency? How to consider data efficiency and resource efficiency together? Uh, for example, less data but more computing. Uh, I think 
um, what's needed here is uh, better telemetry, understanding uh, the different components of the and uh, then and assign cost based on uh, the different uh, aspects of uh, computing cost, whether that's moving data, whether that's uh, computation, whether that's storage um, in uh, persistent or non-persistent memory. Okay, thank you, Michael. The next question is by Hasham El Bakuri. How to achieve negative carbon footprint in data center? This question was already asked and answered, but Hasham joined just recently. I think he missed the time zone, so if you don't mind repeating the answer. Yeah, so there are multiple aspects to that. Um, one is uh, to source uh, energy uh, from uh, sustainable energy, uh, renewable energy. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've also used uh, carbon offsets uh, to uh, offset uh, any carbon emissions. Plus, uh, we've invested significantly in, uh, in environmentally efficient uh, buildings and, uh, and, and other. Uh, we've literally optimized many parts of the business to be uh, based on uh, minimizing uh, the um, environmental footprint. And uh, there is a sustainability report. Uh, that um, I link to uh, early in the talk that uh, you might uh, find more details about uh, that. Okay, thank you, Michael. This was the last question. Is there anybody else who would like to ask anything? Please feel free to ask in person. You don't need to have uh, to type in. Well, if not, uh, Michael, I uh, really thank you in, on behalf of Santa Clara Valley section and all attendees. Uh, uh, it was an uh, exceptional presentation. I really enjoyed, learned a lot, and uh, we will post this um, video uh, with Michael's approval. And Michael, if you don't mind sending me the slides, if that's okay, you, you are welcome to filter them if there's anything. and. Uh, Again, I'll make the video available to you so that you can see if you want to remove anything, uh, if, if anything slipped that you would like. Thanks again, and thanks all the audience. You have a lot of attendees uh, from across the world, from India. It's very early over there, and the holiday people sacrifice just to listen to you. Thank you much. It's a privilege. Thanks for having me. It was our great pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone.